Hello and welcome to Minds of Mountain Film. I'm Abe Streep. I'm an editor, editor with Outside Magazine. I'm here with Conrad Anker, a mountaineer and author um, who has summoned Everest twice and most recently on a trip to recreate George Mallory's 1924 expedition. Correct. That's correct. That was 2007. Uh huh. That we were there, and the film with that, uh, The Wildest Dream, is showing this evening here at Mountain Film. Yep. Now, um, so the, the premise of the film is you, are, you are in, and Leo Holding are trying to climb the second step of Everest without a ladder, um, as Mallory would or could have potentially. Um, and what it what going in, you had done this, it was sort of, you've done this in 1999, you, the second time you had climbed this route this yeah. way, correct? So going in, did you have any sort of preconception or idea of whether you thought this would be possible? Uh, to back up a little bit, in 99 I was there, part of the expedition, yeah. and it was the initial Mallory and Irvine research expedition. There was a documentary that was made, it was a good documentary, but we were sort of punch drunk mountaineers up on Everest and it didn't have the historical background that Mallory and Irvin really deserved. So there's always been a group of people that contacted me, oh I'd like to make a film, do something like this. And then when Anthony Geffen, the um, producer director from Altitude Films approached me, it seemed like a perfect fit, um, especially someone from England that knew the story, knew English culture and could take those nuances of what exploration was like in 1924 and translate it into the film. So that was the beginning of the sort of how we started with it. It took us two or three years to get to Everest in 2007. And part of it was the pivotal second step, which is a 90-foot cliff band at 28,300 feet. Yeah. And so the, the, which has been, people have debated for a long time whether Mallory actually could have gotten past that second step. Yeah. So you, the, there's been a ladder there since 1975, if I'm correct, right? So you went up without, moved the ladder out. And yes. So it was June 14, 2007. The uh, team of Sherpas that we were working with pulled the ladder and then I led it as you would a rock climb. Yeah. Say something here in Telluride where you lead up and you play skier, you have your rope as a safety net. So uh, in 99, the ladder was there and I stepped on it at one point just mm -hmm. because I had to traverse around it. and. To paraphrase Mallory, why did I step on the ladder? Well, because it was there. Yeah. <laughs> so it was great. When it wasn't there, I had to free climb it. Yeah. And the, uh, it was also slightly different because you were wearing different clothes this time. You were, you were... In the 2007, we wore uh, period clothing yeah. up to about uh, 7,400 meters. And then after that, it just um, it didn't make any sense. It, my fingers and toes are far too precious and yeah. basically going up there in rugby cleats and uh, wool and cotton yeah. clothing is a lot less than what we would normally use. So when, when you set out, was the idea, did you think that you were going to do the whole, the whole route in that, in that period, Garb, or did you know at a certain point you were going to? We, it was in the back of our mind, but then it was sort of like, well, I'm going to use supplemental oxygen and we can't, trying to make a recreation oxygen apparatus, even at it was it was beyond what we were able yeah. to do and um, so you just can't build oxygen setups you have to have this whole engineering thing there's a medical permit that goes into it all these things that I learned about it so we realized that we we're gonna switch out of it but it was um, good to see that second step in the state that they encountered in 1924 which is without any human intrusion to yeah. it. So without playing too much of a spoiler for the film what is what do you think do you think what did you think before you got to that second step without the ladder and then after do you think you could have done it I've always since the beginning it's um, in 99 and my view on it is that um, it's possible they could have summited but it's not likely it's highly improbable given the difficulty of it there but it's not my position as a as a simply a climber and mm -hmm. The beginning of the 21st century to say unequivocally they did or didn't make it. It's good that we have these mysteries and that it was there. Certainly they could have done it. It would have been the most challenging and amazing feat of climbing to do it in 1924 without um, the protection techniques that we use. They didn't have carabiners, they didn't have any protection. Rope was basically tied around the rope and it was tied around our waist and it was a safety net that would keep you from sliding down the hill. But the, 
the belay, the, the, the systems that we use in climbing really came around beginning in the 30s and then after the Second World War advanced and then all the climbers that have come before me have passed that knowledge on to me, including Mallory, mm -hmm. allowing me to be where I am now with climbing technique. Yeah. And, you know, I, the, you, to back up again to the 1999 expedition, you were on the trip that yeah. found mm -hmm. um, Mallory's remains. So was this, was it sort of bittersweet in a way, this return trip, or? It was, um, it brought conclusion to it. It was, um, it was good to go back there. We went to the location where Mallory is resting. It was too snowy, so did not see his body. But um, it was nice to do a film that really honors Mallory. And the cast that Anthony was able to bring together, uh, Liam Neeson is the narrator, Ralph Fiennes is the voice of Mallory, and uh, Liam Neeson's late wife, Natasha Richardson, being the yeah. voice of Ruth, was really great. And Hopefully in 20 years you could take this disc off the shelf and watch it and be like, great, I've learned something about Mallory, I know what it was like, and it's a good historical piece. So there's no dramatization, there's no fictional stuff in there, it's very much based on fact. And uh, along with that, you, you also brought a young climber with you, as Mallory did. Yes. Um, Leo Holding. And that's, from seeing the film, that's one of the sort of points of tension is you're recreating this and it's this historical thing but at the same time you're climbing Mount Everest and you have a lot of people up there and there's uh, I am I can imagine being worried for the safety of everyone especially someone who hasn't been there yeah Leah Holding was the perfect guy for this and when Anthony and I were in the development stage of this he said well who should we get yeah to, to not to play Sandy. I mean, there are places where we're in period costume and you can't see our face and it's just distant shots that give you the place. But we never are actors. We're, we're always just being ourselves. And Leo is the perfect guy. He's 14 years younger than I am. He'd never been to Everest. There's all these parallels that he had with Sandy Irvin. Um, of course, he's a very talented rock climber and he's strong and he did really well mm -hmm. um, right off the bat. So there was never a problem mm -hmm. with that. Um, you were also going with a big crew. What's it like taking a big film crew up on it? It's um, that's something of a challenge. It, it's stressful. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, we were there late in the season. We had to wait till everyone was off. We summited June 14th, which to date is the latest pre-monsoon ascent of Everest from either side, and the monsoon was boiling up from the uh, Gangetic Plain and coming in on us, and we barely made it, and we did it. But it was. Um, Anytime you're filming with that, there's a lot of communication, a lot of decision making that needs to be made on a continual daily basis. So every evening, <laughs> the thundering herd comes in. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Young boys, baggy pants, flat brimmed hats, skate boards, who <laughs> like them. But there was um, to to have this daily meeting. Like, how are we going to do this? What? what's our next shot going to be? How are we going to manage the logistics with the Sherpas? So yeah. I was there playing myself and being the, the connection to the 1999 expedition and then my knowledge of Mallory and Irvin going back and just having been immersed in it and it, it being my life story, um, for better or worse, it's the Mallory thing is what yeah. defined me. So working all that in there and then being expedition leader and figuring out logistics, food, who's doing well, someone might not do, be feeling well, uh, adjusting it accordingly. Quite an expedition, man. That was good fun. Yeah. <laughs> but it came back, everyone was fine. Yeah, healthy. yeah. <laughs> so let's, uh, I see you're wearing your 350.org shirt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you just got back from Nepal, correct? Where you were, talk a little, about, a little bit about your trip there and some of the climate work you're doing now. Yeah, thanks, Abe. I just got back, uh, on Wednesday from five weeks in Nepal working with uh, the Extreme Ice Survey, which is uh, James Baylog, who's presented here at Mountain Film, his uh, effort to document glaciers. And he specializes in time-lapse photography in which a camera is set up, an image is taken every half hour, and then six months, a year, two years, three years later, all, that, all those images are brought together and then they're stitched together. So you have a, a real-time image of a glacier moving. So it, it's this visual proof and as he says seeing is believing you see the glacier melt before your eyes mm -hmm. to date the work with uh, the extreme ice survey has been in high latitude glaciers and in glacier national park 
And to really make it visually appealing, glaciers that move and that are active tell a great story. So when you have these uh, Illisat Glacier in Greenland calving three miles in, in, in 75 minutes in these big events and they're captured and they're, and they're brought into a digital format, it's really telling how the climate is changing. The glaciers in Glacier National Park are simply deflating. They're, they're losing mass with time, but there's no action to it. So we wanted to see high altitude glaciers. So we went to uh, Nepal, we installed five cameras, um, four of them specifically on the Khumbu Icefall, which is one of the three principal glaciers coming off Mount Everest and is very active. And then one on the uh, south face of uh, Amit Blam on the Nare Glacier. So we set up the cameras and then we also researched uh, historical images from the 1963 American Everest expedition. We took those pictures and we were able to, to compare them side to side. So one will have, this is what the glacier looked like then. You can see the mass of ice is, is far less than it was. And then secondly, we're going to be having these time lapses that will show the movement of the ice. Now, um, the, the, have you seen any of the return, the footage yet? We had a five day, we set up one camera, we had five days, came back, pulled the cards just to check all the systems were there. And within five days, we probably, just guessing without putting the surveyors and the GIS mapping technology into the, the data, which it then turns into photographs, can now be turned into scientific data with uh, computer programs. We probably measured between half and two meters of movement in four days. So the, um, the, the ice fall is, the Kumbu ice fall is the main ice fall that people right. climb up to get to the summit of Everest on the south side, the Nepal side. And we were able to see that movement in a four day period. And it's, um, it's remarkable. And it's one of these things that just in four days. So when we get our first data back in October after six months, we'll see change already within that. And hopefully um, in the, the two year permit time frame we have from the Nepal government, we're going to see quite a bit of change. And um, the Nepal government was very supportive of this project. And we're hoping that we'll be able to continue the install, leave the cameras in there for in, in an indefinite period of yeah. time. So I have time for one more question. And um, it's, it seems like a very, it's a great project. And climbers and uh, adventurers aren't, have, aren't always seen as necessarily, haven't traditionally been the most socially active group. Right, social activists, but yeah, this is. Well, I beg to differ. Well, I think they are. I think they are, yeah. and they can be. But yep. there's, you know, you go to Mount Everest, you're flying. You're yeah. flying a long way, and every every day we're all part of the problem. Yeah. So do you do you do you hope that this sort of will be something of a turning point in that um, respect? So I'll begin with a, yeah. the big, I think climbers are very active with the environment. We go back to Thoreau and Walden, and they began with the appreciation of it. Uh, John Muir created the conservation movement, something that we have uh, exported to Europe, and they have then embraced our values. He was a, a great climber. You climb Cathedral Peak, and the guy did it in uh, leather shoes, and it's a 5-6 climb. He soloed it. It's amazing. He did that in yeah. before the turn of the century. And then he was able to convince... Uh, Theodore Roosevelt. And then you have David Brower, um, who was the ED of the Sierra Club, a pioneering climber. He did a lot of great work with that. And so he had the political awareness that he brought into the environment. And then the next segue in that was um, is Yvonne Chouinard, who was a climber and then took it to a business model. The, the climbing is about getting by with a minimal amount of equipment because you can't carry it all up there and, and being efficient. So he took that, that essence of climbing mentality and applied it to his business. And now they're an open source uh, sustainability company to businesses from Walmart yeah, to the Department of the Defense. They're all going, you guys are onto something. You're not just a bunch of tree hugging hippies out yeah. there. I mean, you're doing the right thing. So they brought it into the business thing. And then you have uh, climbers like uh, Mark Udall, who's a uh, senator from the state of Colorado who'd climbed Kanchenjunga. So, well, I guess I'm well, saying that the, um, and I know we have to wrap it up here, but the, the, the this is a very active, there have been, people who carry that ethos and are climbers yeah. and who do great work. But this is a very active way of while you're on an expedition to sort of yeah. engage in, in, in an act. Yeah, it's meaningful. And for myself personally, I'm 
in my late 40s and I've had a great career of climbing. It's given me a tremendous um, opportunity in life and everything like that. It's my chance to give something back. But significantly, as climbers, we are the canary in the coal mine. You might live in Kansas and go golfing and climate change is so far removed. You turn your air conditioner on, you drive your car and as long as the oil is, we get oil at $3 a gallon for gasoline, you don't see what climate change is going. You go to the high mountains and it's like they're shrinking, the winters are two weeks shorter, um, they're melting faster, glacial lakes are building up. There's all these, these things that build into it. So it's not just my, what I want to do, it's my responsibility to take this information this knowledge that I'm gathering from the high mountains and share it with as many people as we can because when you see a shrinking glacier, it requires no translation, it requires no graphs, it requires, it doesn't need Al Gore making a movie and going up on an escalator yeah. to show the, th the CO2 level in the It's planet. not an opinion thing. Yeah, no, I saw it's those like, images it's gone. David yeah. Bashir showed last year of just the historical images over yeah, time. Yeah, all so, the time we have, but thanks very much. Abe? And, yeah. Thanks. All right. <laughs> we'll have fun. Yeah. All right. You too. Have a yeah. good weekend.